It's absolutely brilliant. Honestly, I, I really appreciate the, the full answers that you're giving to my questions. Um, I do have like half a dozen more, so I'll try not. Yeah, just go on. Brilliant. Excellent. So is there one band that you've not worked with, which would be your dream job of mixing and mastering their material in your own studio? Uh, that's a very good question because there have been some times when, when I felt that I, I might be able to do something to, to even some of my favorite bands, which is not very metal related. But then again, it, it comes more down to the fact that, that they are not really the same band anymore that they used to be. So when I would kind of get into production or mixing with these guys and the songs would be the kind of songs they write these days and i would try to give them the sound i love from the late 80s or early 90s they would probably yeah. shoot me you know <laughs> so that was never anything that worked for me this thing but i must admit that that it was pretty special for me to work with rage and refuge because i was quite a fan of of the perfect man album you know don't you feel the winter and that kind of stuff and i also had a little bit of a connection with with pv from Rage uh, because he actually owned the skull that's on the Nightingale Briefing Shadow album. Oh, yeah. Uh, so yeah, and, and my wife uh, was best friends with his then girlfriend. So we hung out a bit and parted a bit and, and to get to work with, with him and mix Rage albums that came out as Rage, you know, and see them live. They play those songs and they play the old hits and all that. That was kind of cool. And, and, um, and I think I, I was, I was doing a good job at giving them what they wanted at the time. And uh, that that's that's kind of cool. And I, I don't think there is too many bands out there where I can honestly say that, oh, if you work with me, it would sound so much better. And I would do such a great difference to your sound because most of these bands are, are bigger now than when I worked with them, you know? <laughs> so they, they kind of made this huge leap and they are now working with, with their dream producers and dream mixers. And... Why the fuck would they come to me even for like a, a, a DVD sound or remastering a demo? You know, they're in another league now. So all, all the bands I would love to work with again, because I still care about their music. I, I don't know. It would just be, would be weird, you know, because yeah. it, 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 I knew it would be for them a step down. And um, I'm actually quite happy. You know, some of the best things that I get to do here, here at work is, is to take that, that first album with a band or a project, like I did this Mord Cowl from Belgium. They're all, all really good musicians. They, I mixed an album with the drummer's band before and they've all been in bands, but this is now the Mord Cowl's first album. And I, I helped them get exactly this sound, what they wanted. And now I see this is their first release and they're promoting it online and this and that. And I just, I get so much joy of, of being the chosen one for that out of all the other ones they could have chosen. And, that gives me really much joy to be at the beginning with a band because if I play my cards right and, and so maybe they come back at least for the next one, you know, to be there with, with this embryonic state of bands and also um, remixing old stuff, remastering stuff with, with, with a lot of, of care, you know, that, that's really, really what I love. And being that guy with all the pressure also from a big band that, that still sell pretty good and have booked out world tours. I'm not really in that league, you know? And yeah. um, every time I, I feel that, you know, even, even when a band says like a contract or whatever, I get, I, I start to feel all weird. No, no, I cannot have a contract. <laughs> but that's not how I do things, you know? I'm just, I'm just a dude mixing and mastering stuff. When you start talking about lawyers or contracts or even managers, they scare the fuck out of me. <laughs> Management, you know? No, I like to speak straight to the dudes. And, and I make the same money. Let's say that I would mix the, the next, I don't know, creator record. I make the same money as mixing that completely unknown, unsigned band from somewhere in Holland. Yeah. I make the same money, but I don't have all the same pressure, all the same strangeness that can appear out of the blue. You know what I mean? Our a &R guy think the snare is too loud, blah, 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 that, <laughs> oh, you know? That doesn't happen. I get the same paycheck. So I'm super happy where I am. And I think also that some bands feel this, that, that I'm just like the sonic handyman, you know, I, you know, you have to tell me a little bit what you want. You, you, you bring me the right stuff. I would just build your sonic kitchen the way you want it and make sure that it runs smoothly. I will not all of a sudden say, I think your kitchen should be over there and all in pink or I'm out of here. You know, 
that's that's not me <laughs> i'm not that type of of aggressive mixer who wants to to fuck with your mind and, and give you ideas that you should have no reverb or whatever because i'm on a no reverb trip yeah but that's your personal trip don't fuck that band up maybe they don't have the guts to say no to you because you are somewhat famous you know i'm not that kind of guy you know and it's it's my niche and i'm super happy here and and sometimes when i wake up in the morning i think fuck i cannot believe this is my life i get to do this at this level for a living and i'm actually making way more money now than when i was a full-time salesman in a music shop so you know <laughs> no complaints <laughs> there you go i mean um if you're happy to go to your work every morning um and you're just happy with the level of the bands i mean mother of the graves there's 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 huge like ripples in the underground with them and you can say that you were there right from the very beginning and it's the same with me and interviews as well i've only been doing online interviews since like august because uh, i was just overcoming a fear of doing them um, i was always doing like email interviews because it was easy to hide behind a keyboard and take time and asking the questions so um but I'm, I'm delighted to hear that you're happy where you are um and long may that be the case um <laughs> Yeah, I hope you're happy too. I mean, uh, to making interviews live. I mean, I've done it for so long. I started doing interviews, I think exactly, I, if you don't count all these strange interviews I did for fan scenes when I played punk or whatever. I th my first interview was actually in 1991 with, with Rock Hard magazine in, in Germany with, with Frank Albrecht. And, yeah. and he told me that the first thing I told him was that I don't like death metal. <laughs> and he just started laughing his brains out and he said i cannot print that you will kill your career guy and i say i don't care i listen only to indie rock you know that's me you know i'm just like so over that shit already and there i was 60 70 phone interviews ahead of me and just being on this i don't like metal trip yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so i toned it down a little bit uh, after frank you know put me straight i am eternally grateful for him doing that but um yes. i like this i think it's fantastic that people want to spend a couple of hours of their day talking to me i think it's super and of course typing is sometimes my preferred way of doing things because um the, when i need uh, when i'm right in the middle of mixing and mastering like a million things i can answer a, a question a day or whatever say i might take a few weeks but you get good answers and uh because I cannot take two hours now to just talk, you know, and you don't have the hassle of, of typing everything later. <laughs> but um, after a while, I, I don't know, my fingers start to hurt and my shoulders start to hurt from all the fucking typing that sometimes it's, it's easier just talking, you know? And honestly, a part of this whole COVID thing, not, not even being extra talky with your neighbors or whatever, it's nice to, to talk every, every now and then to someone else and my wife or to my dog. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I mean, un unfortunately, another thing with this COVID is uh, mental health is huge at the moment. Um, it's just, it's good to talk. Um, even workplaces have adapted. I mean, even in my workplace, they're saying like, we no longer need to be in the office five days a week now. You can come into the office three days and work from home for two days. It's just changed everybody's life now. But um, I just want some normality back. But anyway. Yeah. So is it. But anyway, so you've been involved with so many of your own bands that are no longer active. I mean, I'm thinking my favourites are like Panimonium and obviously Edge of Sanity. But if there was one band that you would like to release new material, which of your bands would it be? Uh, or are you just not? Or are you just taking really time out now and just not doing anything musical, music wise? No, I, I have a, a massive time out since um, since I finished uh, the Northern Sanctuary with Witherscape. Yeah, and fucked fuck my voice up. I um, I haven't done anything. I, I kind of fell into a musical depression a little bit because that album, and especially the title track, that's all I ever wanted to say in this kind of realm yeah. of music, what, what I built. And that album just kind of disappeared. And I know why, because we just released it. We didn't tour it. We didn't do anything. It just came out and disappeared. But then that on top of everything else, you know, with me, growling my voice away pretty much and um i i just felt that fuck music for a bit you know and i i felt that if i should take my mixing and mastering to the next level there had to be a change and that change is moving the stuff finding a house to to have it in work from home and and don't write music anymore because 
I, I'm sure uh, a lot of musicians, I don't know if you're a musician yourself or. I'm probably, on... I'm, I'm probably the best air guitarist you're ever like. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the thing is with, with me that, that I, I, I'm not really saying this seriously. I don't have multiple personalities, but there are certain ways that I can evolve in certain situations that I don't like about yeah. myself. And one of them is when I am a musician, when I am writing an album or a song or whatever, I am the most antisocial asshole you ever met. <laughs> and that means that I am this to my wife and to my friends and everyone, because I get all like, um, there's probably some kind of mental thing. You know, my father was a little bit the same. He was not being an asshole, but when he was focused on something, the outside world just didn't exist. You know, he could knock on his door and he just wouldn't answer. It's like, oh, puppy is busy. He's painting or he's drawing or whatever. You know, he's just in the zone. And I have that with writing. And the yeah. more songs you have written, the harder it is to come by the really good ones that, that keeps you motivated and inspired. And when I had to juggle all the time between writing the new Witherscape album and mixing and mastering other people's album, and I come to work and I saw, oh, nothing in the inbox. Cool, I can work on that idea you know you start hammering out demo drums you start and all of a sudden it's an email there and i am still the musician guy yeah i hate that person who wants to mix an album with me i just want to tell him to die <laughs> because you're you're interrupting my fucking art you f you know what i mean yeah and then i kind of sober up and think fuck uh okay friendly answer you know all is cool and then i completely lost all interest in writing music just took out of the zone and that's how it was for me since i rebooted my musical career with the signing of century media i was balancing two worlds at all times and trying to balance a distance relationship with my now wife on top of that yeah and it actually um i still suffer from this today with, with psoriasis and all kinds of shit problems uh, tinnitus from stress not not really doing anything to my hearing other than having two bass notes rumbling around in my head and it's all stress related from inner stress from me having what turned out to be a major label contract since Sony bought Century Media and having to do a lot of stuff. I mean, I did two full length albums and an EP with Witherscape, a full length album with Nightingale just in a couple of years, traveling to Sweden, back to Germany, juggling, writing, singing, recording, and this with others. And it just came to a halt there at the end of, of the second winter's game. Fuck, I have to decide. Am I being a musician now or am I being the other one? And just, I make probably in one year enough to pay the bills for yeah. one month from my music. But I make a good living from the other. So I just kind of, fuck that, sold the drum kit. Everything else is just like stored away. And um, I don't even have a microphone connected normally here in the mix room. So I had to dig one out today for <laughs> talking to you. So it, it's just like so far away. I still have a keyboard here behind me for whenever the computer is busy with some calculation or whatever, I can play some nice piano stuff just because I have that 4,000 euro piece standing here, you know, <laughs> screaming, use me, use me. But it's just like, okay, there you go. And um <laughs> that's how it is you know i had to make that decision and it's and it's so that when a band should do new music first of all the song would have to be as good as anything that could fit on the previous release that band or project did and i just don't have it in me you know i started writing a death metal thing a couple of years back and out of maybe the 50 ideas i thought i had one was good enough to actually be on a record the rest was just like me going through the motions and it was not even giving me like a musical hard on so who the <laughs> fuck else am i gonna inspire you know because all the songs i have released up until this date except maybe a few like infested tracks or you know what i mean like the really yeah. serious shit i love every second of it especially the shit i did in the last like in the century media times it's all fantastic and all of a sudden, I just felt like the well had really fucking ran dry this time. Yeah. I felt that around 2004 for the first time. And then I rebooted in like 2008 and I had it still enough to do the Retribution album with Nightingale and, you know, the first and second with Escape and this and that. And that's really now it's like all empty, you know, and the only way for me to ever 
come back to the point where I could write a decent metal song again is for just wait for those magical ideas to show up to inspire me, but I cannot be forced into it, you know. So if any band should do anything, I, I think it would be great to to write another, like one with Escape song would be cool. One even sounding a bit like Pandemonium, for example, would be cool. Um, but everyone's like, no, it doesn't work. We need a full length album or is like, no, fuck that, you know. <laughs> I can hardly write one riff that I like. How the fuck am I gonna write 100, you know? <laughs> now that's not gonna work. So. Um, I'm happy where I am, and I know some people find it annoying, but I like to remix my old shit and release it again, and I'm always messing around with remixing the first Edge of Sanity album, the second Edge of Sanity album. I will transfer and remix all that I can from Edge of Sanity, only because I learned so fucking much from it from an engineering standpoint, yeah. because I have to salvage this shit. It's so terribly recorded. Even the shit I did and also the shit I didn't do sounds like ass. And I don't know how it turned out to be kind of okay, but I am digging in there, you know, and um, I have a pretty exciting time digging around like in a time capsule with, with those old recordings. And that's what I do when I have a rare occasion of downtime. I start remixing and remastering old shit from me because yeah. people might think that in 2021, an acoustic drum kit comes sounding top notch. I'm telling you, sometimes the recordings are so bad. I cannot really believe that someone said, yeah, that sounds great. Let's record now. You know, it's like, what? You know, so I have to salvage a lot of acoustic drum recordings still to this day. And I learned then from having salvaged some shit from 1991. And then I can just apply that trick to that album I just got. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think that uh, you, you you have to s never stop experimenting. Don't think that you know all, just all the time. How can I make that thing sound uh, like, how can I bring that terrible sounding kick drum into sounding like a really good kick drum without triggering it? How can I manipulate the original acoustic audio to sound fat and punchy, you know, and, and to just try everything, you know? And I have learned so many things from trying to correct my own errors and others from past recordings. And I use these tricks to this day yeah. to make to make good recordings sound better or terrible stuff sound decent, you know? Thanks for that. You, you, you gave me a musical hard on when you said like, um, do a pandemonium <laughs> single. I went, what? <laughs> that would be good. <laughs> but um, do you think you said that you had like 50 riffs, your death metal project, you had like 50 riffs and you felt that only one is good enough. Do you think partly the reason for that is, is because you're doing all this mixing and mastering and you hear what other bands are doing and you feel that their shit is just so much better? Yeah, that, that actually nothing kills the buzz as hearing an album in the same genre you thought of doing, yeah. being all you wanted it to be and a bit more. You know, like, oh, let's make an all like a, let's, I want to write like a left hand path kind of album, you know, and have exactly that guitar tone, exactly all that stuff. And then you get like a, an album from Revel in Flesh or Sentient Horror to mix. And it's all that and better than you could ever do. Because these guys are young and inspired, yeah. not old farts like me. It's like, what the fuck am I going to do now? Compete with this? Yeah. Fuck that shit. What am I going to do now then, you know? And then you have to, oh. And then the moment you realize that what you could do is nothing you would be inspired with because it's not the genre you care about or listen to. You know, I love the idea to make one or two songs in a certain style just because there is one or two songs in that style I actually like, but I never listened to a full album of, let's say, Funeral Doom. Yes. I, I, would, I would fall asleep after 10 minutes. So Indeed. let's make a 10 minute song, you know, and make it the best it can be. But if I had to make three or four more, I would shoot myself. I cannot do that. And that's the thing about being inspired to do like the best death metal album and then hearing time after time that other do it and they are better than you. This is very uninspiring for me. And I know people who say, oh, don't care about this. Your stuff will be excellent. Yeah, but what made me wanting to get into the death metal world when it actually kind of became death metal there in the end of 80s, early 90s, was because I felt I could make a difference. Yeah. I heard all these kind of what I want to hear, but I thought, 
if I write this shit myself, I can take what I like about leprosy, what I like about Slowly We Rot, what I like about the first Pestilence album, but also what I like about Voivod and what I like about Candlemas and just do it in a blender and just like, that's my sound, you know? That's yeah. not out there yet. And everyone who heard it, wow, that's so fresh, that's so original, you sing clean, you have cellos, you do this, you have not double bass drums, you have no guitar solos. Wow! And from that bus that fed me, you know, all these years to make to be the to make the next crazy thing to open a, the album with that kind of thing and then bring more of the Marillion vibe in there and bring more of that vibe and try to. I mean, the most successful Edge of Sanity song is without growling. How the fuck did that happen? <laughs> you know, it's like ah, and and I think okay. That's me just being, you know, fed the bus. Oh, cool that you did that gothic song. I thought, I will make another one and I will show you that, you know. <laughs> but these days when you're constantly getting stuff, both for mastering and for mix, that is way better than, than that I could do because I'm so out of the loop when it comes to writing. I remember I had this, um, this thing. I wanted to try out some new uh, guitar plugin or whatever. And I thought, I think I will play a bit guitar. That's the best way to, to see if it feels right and this and that. And then I woke up the next morning, I think, what the fuck happened to my left arm? You know, I sleep weird or whatever. No, fuck, I played guitar for like 20 minutes yesterday. That's why, you know, that's how out of shape I am, you know, oh, yeah. because all that riffing and all that stuff, I don't do that kind of shit normally. I just put my fucking fingers on the, on the keyboard or hold the mouse. <laughs> So all that action made it, whoa, that's shitty. And then you realize that you're far away from being able to just bash out an album, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Nobody or nothing could ever take away your legendary status, but just liken it to football. I mean, you've got Zlatan Ibrahimovic, for example. Um, yeah. He'll always be a legend in football, but you've got somebody like Mbappe uh, of PSG that is just, um, the youth, the mu in, in musical terms, Death Metal was unique and it was absolutely brilliant because it was so chaotic and there were mistakes and all the rest of it. Now it's so professional. The uh, youngsters just want to play riffs at a thousand miles an hour, you know? Yeah. I like Death Metal. My best ever Death Metal album, and no offence here, was uh, Obituary Cause of Death. Um, yeah. Because it's simplistic riffs. I love the double bass, the vocals, and of course, James Murphy. Um, but now they just want to do frigging thousand miles an hour stuff and you just get lost in it. Just yeah, again. Yeah, it is. It is really so. I do the athlete comparison a lot too, you know, because we, we are pretty pretty the same, and it's it's like sometimes uh, we we had a, a really famous high jumper here called Patrick Kraberi, and he was I don't know how high they jump, but I think they did like two point something meters, you know, and yeah. it was like, like a sensation when he did it, and he he was practicing all the fucking time to reach that and make that one jump you know and he yes. was always that guy but to ask him 20 years later ah oh, cannot do that jump again just yes. for me you know look here here's a pair of shoes you can just jump you know so no sorry i cannot you know and that's how musicians are sometimes and some stay in the game they're even better now than they were in the early 90s yes. but i am not i, I in my head I am a better drummer the older I get. But when I actually get to sit down behind a drum kit, I'm the worst, you know? It's like, I've lost really? touch with all my limbs. It's just like, hello, right foot, what the fuck are you doing, you know? <laughs> and uh, I get weird cramps, I get blisters. <laughs> you know, it's, I'm like an old man behind the kit. Oh guys, I have to take a break. Yeah, but we played a three minute song. Sorry, you know, <laughs> that's me. And ah, oh, fuck that, that's so terrible. So I just said, Focus on on what you yeah what you are good at you know and where there is a financial future and you can actually get some retirement money coming in and this and that yeah. other than trying to be a musician because I was never made for the touring life you know I, I I hated that I even hated playing live because I never felt it would be as magical as I thought it would be uh, there were some hardcore gigs I did with Wounded Knee when I played the drums where I was just a drum drum guy playing super fast. And I saw that people were impressed with my drumming because yeah. I was pretty good at the time. Um, that was enough. I didn't hear the drums. Uh, sorry, I didn't hear the bass or the guitar. I just played because I had the songs in my head. And that was a blast. Yeah. But that was never the case with Edge of Sanity. I was the singer, fucked my throat up all the fucking time. And it was just never what I thought it would be. 
And then you had all the other shit with the traveling and this and that and sleeping arrangements or whatever when you were away on these little so-called tours. Yeah. And um, no, I was just happier at home doing my thing. And uh, that's why I kind of slowly killed all my projects by, sorry, I have a full-time job as a studio guy. I also have a kid to take care of. Cannot do the touring, cannot do this. So sorry. But it was like, hmm, kind of made that excuse happen. You know what I mean? Yeah. You must have loved that uh, festival appearance. Was it Partizan with Bloodbath, with the Castatonia guys and Michael and stuff like that? You must have loved that. We did the Wacken thing. Yeah. Uh, then, then I was actually still a member of the project. And then I, I also did um, a guest appearance uh, singing Eaton with Bloodbath on, on Wacken again. Uh, now with, with Nick Holmes as a singer. And yeah. I've guested also with um, Heaven Shall Burn a couple of times doing Black Tears and fucking yeah. it up both times. <laughs> <laughs> so talking about your growling then, obviously Witherscape, I think, was pretty much the last time you growled. Are you still getting headaches? And is this pretty much the end of your growling days? Or do you still get like bands wanting to do a guest? Yeah, all the time, you yeah. know. It does, doesn't stop. I think I got like yesterday or the day before. And I, I kind of have a, a cut, copy, paste answer these days because I, everyone deserves an explanation, but I just cannot go on writing that stuff again because it's like, oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm so tired. I've done it now for five years. But um, no, my, my voice is, um, it's, it's kind of in a resting phase because I, I figured that, um, you know, the headaches I had, from the, from the with escape session i mean they were always there there was always a problem i was always fucked up from growling that that's like i do it in in such a way that um i am extremely loud like over 100 decibels or more i break fucking microphone capsules with my my volume you know and that comes from somewhere because yeah. every fucking muscle in my body is tensed especially the neck muscle and the, the, the thing is that um, I think also since my psoriasis, especially much on the head, some shit is going on there also with the skin being fucked up all the time that it was like some when I did growling in, in the later years, I was, of course, overweight, out of shape, didn't really do any growling until I had to growl on the record, which is not helping, you know, yeah. and um, it just felt like um, they put my head in a wrench and just tighten it more and more. And I had this thing with the Northern Sanctuary that I must double all the growls and triple them or quadruple them or even more, you know? And I had to sing it perfect each time so that the syllables match and the S's match, you know? Yeah. And, and it's really hard to, to make that happen. I didn't want to spend years editing. So I thought, oh, I better get it right. And when you're in the vibe, that's one thing. But when you actually start, you know, stop the computer and sit down. That's when those headaches start start coming. And and what I had at the very end of that very intense period, because I had to finish it at a certain date because of this and that, I just felt I'm I'm gonna die. This is me. This is over. Because that headache was was like mother of all headaches, wow. and also the way I fucked my throat up and how I couldn't talk and how it kind of hurt physically hurt. I think now you overdid it, you fucking idiot, you know, because I really did. It's like I was singing three, four albums at the same time. And normally it was enough doing one line of growl every now and then. Yeah. And I just kind of overdid it. And that's, um, that's how shit happens sometimes. You just do it too much. And then your body fucks up and you suffer for it sometimes for the rest of your life. Like that fateful morning in 2000 when I fucked my knee up. It's with me every day. And it was just that microsecond of some device in the gym that just decided to fuck my knee up and doesn't heal, cannot heal. It's one of those sport injuries that, yeah, sorry, career is over. <laughs> and I got one, you know, and I, I'm afraid that my voice is, is fucked, uh, but I will go and seek uh, professional help yeah. of all kinds. When I feel that, that um, I have that vibe that I would like to sing now, I will, um, of course, COVID doesn't make anything easier because I don't want to do it on <laughs> Skype or whatever. I want to be in a room with a professional vocal coach and, um, and learn really to warm up, to, to really sing, to learn it. And then we will see if, if it's only that I didn't sing for so long that, that 
makes it, you know, when I sing along to a track in the car, I'm, my voice is, is shot in like two phrases and it's gone, you know? So it, it's really nasty and growling is just like, oh, yeah. no way, you know? Yeah. It's, it's like you finally have all your new teeth and then you bang them all out with a hammer, you know? That's, that's not really what I want to do. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I hope everything goes okay with your throat and stuff like that. Because yeah, uh, me too. There, there's, there's some shit to sing on, you know. So I would like yeah. to get at least my, my clean back in shape. That, that would yeah. be nice. Yeah. Cool. Listen, I've only got two more questions for you here, um, and then you can go and get your dinner. <laughs> um, so before the internet then, magazines and fanzines were the places to find out about new bands and trends, but now publications have been replaced with thousands of websites catering for all genres. So do you think that some of the passion has been lost, or do you think that the internet has been a good thing for music? Well, that's a good question. And um, I think um, that there are still you know a surprising number of fan scenes and magazines still out there yeah and uh, only the strong survive when it comes to this case you need a strong to be like convinced that this rules and they go on doing it or they're actually that good that people still you know subscribe and they go mm -hmm. on doing it so that's still out there and i think um also I i'm not so well educated in the whole online portal thing i don't actually seek out too much places where I can read about interviews and this and that. I get links from time to time uh, because I like to read things um, actually in, in a paper form. Yes. That's still my preferred medium. Or I like to listen to books. That's my absolute favorite thing to do. I have a good speaking voice. I, I listen now to a book about Rush 80s records and it's just like, I'm super addicted. It's so good, you know. <laughs> but uh, having to read it also on an iPad or whatever, it gets a little bit like yeah. uh, you sit there on the sofa. Now you can drive, you can clean, you can do whatever, and still you you read a book. So um, I think it's really good for this new generation of music. Like, like my son, he's like uh, 27, and he's playing in a band called Beverly Kills, and they have never known this other world with printed. Yeah stuff you know for them they he kind of grew up with, with the myspace kind of thing a little bit beyond that so for them that's all and they're like oh we're in this and we're on that and you go out and this portal is important and this and that so i am i am old school and i think it's wonderful that that something happened on internet to take kind of the place of what fan scenes and magazines was and and, and it's i mean you need to have a lot of heart and a lot of time and knowledge to, 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 to do that good also. I mean, there's some terrible stuff there from, from the, the beginning. And it seemed like they were only having a web page to get free CDs or whatever. Yeah. But now that's gone. All you get these days are links. You cannot go and, and sell 50 CDs a month that you get for reviews and actually make a good <laughs> buck, you know? That's yeah. not how it works anymore. So I, I think it's, I think every, every genre will have the, the survivors, you know? Yeah. And um, I think there are some tend to go a little bit too gossipy for my taste, but, but some are really serious and they make this in-depth interviews that a printed magazine would probably not allow eight pages about this. <laughs> but I mean, it's all about scrolling a little bit more and then you have all the pages, you know? Yeah. So um, I think a combination of all is... is fucking excellent and i'm happy they are there you know because i think a lot of my interviews have been spread through uh places such as your own and also recently with, with podcasts and this and that and this is the modern way you know yes. how people seem to do it I, I read a lot of my magazines online but uh rock hard and death forever they're big around here they i still read in in paper form and i tend to read them more carefully really yeah. from cover to cover yeah, um, I'm a wee bit like yourself. I'm more old school. I mean, for somebody like myself, I, it was pleasing to see that um, vinyl, for example, outsold CDs for the first time in uh, decades. Um, I remember when it was just cass cassettes and uh, vinyl and CDs should be burned and stuff like that, you know, but I much, <laughs> I much prefer the, the physical product now. Um, I loved getting, you would, 
you would see a band's putting a demo on a, a fanzine and you'd send two pounds away and a couple of days later you get a cassette back and you get flyers you know, stickers and all the rest of it flying out and letters from the band and stuff now you just go on to like Spotify, you listen to it for 10 seconds, now nah, that's shit, move on to the next <laughs> one. You know, it's too dismissive, you know. But it's, it's a double-edged sword, double-edged sword, I think. Yeah. Um, just my last question for you, Dan. Uh, so what's next on the horizon for Unisound? Like, is there going to be like expansion of the premises or are you going to offer any other services or is it just business as usual, just keep on going in the way you're going? Ah, well, I, I actually had a, a big change. The, um, I think I started like a week ago. I actually cleaned, <laughs> you cleaned? the mix room. <laughs> uh, I cleaned it. <laughs> like I had this um, proper fucking cleaning. I did everything <laughs> out and did everything back in. And uh, I did this kind of women style cleaning with, with a wet cloth on every power supply. You know, everything was cleaned. <laughs> and it was so dusty. I think I did like... 25 rounds of black water to the toilet <laughs> it's like i dust three things like wasn't this water clear like 25 seconds ago oh fuck you know and up again running down so it's actually um i made it really nice in here and um i took out all this kind of it looked a little bit like a junkyard teenage boy room kind of vibe with a lot of stuff everywhere you know yeah. i think I needed to to improve, have a little bit more space, and that took fucking forever. <laughs> Broke my fucking everything back and whatever. Uh, but now it's super nice and easy to clean here, easy to dust because I'm also uh, dog allergic with a dog, meaning that I get asthmatic attacks now from everything. So also to have a, a good clean air in here and you know dust is is not really good. Yeah. And uh, yeah, there were some shit living in the corners. I can tell you that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I have a lot of pet spiders, but I think think they abandoned ship actually now when everything is so fucking clean. Um, so that was that was one thing, you know. And um, apart from that, I've done a, a lot of vinyl remastering for this American label lately, and um, that is something that that kind of it's it's a really weird but a very human thing that yeah. you release CDs and the output volume is like crazy loud because it has to be because the loudness war blah 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 you crush everything and now people realize hmm maybe that wasn't the smartest way to do shit and now when it's being released on vinyl for the first time they ask you if you can maybe put some life back into these digital masters and uh, I've actually picked up a few tricks and there are some really great um, software being developed where you can actually try to put some of the, the snap and the, the pop that was taken out by this digital limiter, um, especially the ones that were done like in the first half of the 2000s where the limiting plugins were pretty terrible and you took a lot of the punch out of the drums and the separation was gone. And you cannot really return all that because it's, it's gone, you know, but you can make it sound more pleasing on the vinyl format. Yeah. Uh, because vinyl in itself is, is a loss, lossy format. I, I know people love vinyl, but it's actually doing a lot of weird shit to the mix. Um, it's making parts, depending on the playing time, this has to happen with the bass being rolled off and this and that. It's a lot of stuff. But what I have done now for uh, some really cool albums, actually, <clears throat> is to um, try to reimagine how the CD could have sounded if they didn't do all that damage to it, yeah. which means bringing back a lot of the, the dynamics through my, my tiny but carefully crafted tweaks and bringing just a life back into it. And, and these days, there are also really good, super transparent tools for dealing with the harshness of the upper mid range where the human ear is like extremely sensitive and vinyl have a way of bringing that out just a little bit more also because people's vinyl equipment uh, is not all that top notch you know it's it's just so and uh when you can smooth out that dynamically not just slap an e eq on it and make yeah. a static change some records when, when the lead guitars start playing there are some some frequencies that just bites your ear off and those will not translate well to vinyl. And the person who's engraving the vinyl will make static tweaks to not fuck it all up, you know? Even yeah. when they're appearing only like every now and then, 
But now with these tools that can have up to 8,000 separate frequency bands, you can target only those extra nasty peaks. You don't even realize that they're gone until they're, you turn it off and think, fuck, that was there. That's nasty, you know? And now it sounds like it probably did in the yeah. big ass monitors in the cool studio. But now when I hear it in my analytical setups that I have here, um, and I know my monitors really well, and they, they, are, they are nasty, and that's why people use them. There's only one sound that works, and that's the best sound ever. All other sounds suck, <laughs> you know? <laughs> it, it, I mean, you probably know the Yamahas. They're black and white. Yes. And I say that, that's what they are. It's either black or white. It's either the best sound ever or it's crap. <laughs> and I needed that, you know, I used to work with other monitors where you could, you could put on like a uh, division bell and then you could put on hotter than hell and both sounded like, mm, sounds okay. <laughs> and I say, like, no, they don't. I don't need you to be this slimy bastard monitor that tried to bring out the best in every sound because you're losing all the nasty details that eventually will show up in this guy's car stereo or in your phone or whatever. So I need a brutally honest speaker to me. And maybe it's not the most accurate monitor when, when you measure it, but, but there is a reason why people use it and swear by it. And, and I am one of those guys who, who saw a big leap forward in my mixing when, when I didn't have to make so many kind of decisions. Should I do a little bit more of this or a little bit more of that? But now you, it's clear. Either you do that or it will suck, you know? Yes. So... Um, I have that vibe and sometimes it's weird when I listen to the stuff. Also, when I listen to like, um, when I was cleaning here, I listened to a lot of, of my, I have like 1500 songs that I love in like a rotation in like a player. And some of them came on and they just sounded so fucking great. And I think that's mixed in these speakers, exactly the same speakers they used for mixing this. I hear it because it sounds fucking perfect. <laughs> and then some other albums will come on. It's like, what the fuck happened here? You know, and they probably mix them in some strange monitors that this guy liked. And it just doesn't translate at all. And when it doesn't work in my speakers, it, it most likely won't translate to yours. You know, yeah. and that's the, the, the funny part about, about speakers. And so when you do this vinyl thing and there are, there are some nasty shit that other speakers might have forgotten to play back to you uh, or just like they were too scooped or too whatever. And that, that is something I really enjoy. And I will try to, to get um, more, more work. The, the most famous work I did so far was Riverside, this Polish prog band. I, I brought some life back because even the prog bands had their albums <laughs> maimed in the mastering. And some of them are actually re-releasing the CDs now with full dynamics. And I'm like, eh, could have told you that. You know, but I, I was... I'm just as guilty as anyone. I've made some of the loudest CDs in the world, but they still sound great. And I get both hate mail and love letters for that same production. I'm like, okay, when you're at the extremes, you have to, you know, both, both ends of the spectrum will, will get to you. Uh, but, but these days I'm just trying to, to, to keep it at the level where it doesn't do any damage and constantly invest in the latest best digital limiting plugin and use the best possible fucking setting even if it's killing my computer i just have to make sure that i don't do any unnecessary damage to yeah. the to digital masters of today because they get a lot of damage through the streaming engines which yeah. is uh, i had a plugin that I, I i didn't end up buying it because it was pretty pricey and also pretty pretty mind fucking where you could <laughs> actually hear what was going to be missing once your master was on uh, the normal Spotify. So you could push one button and there's your 24 bit, 44, whatever master without any, any kind of limitations to it. Yeah. And then you could choose just like Spotify 196 or whatever. And then it sounded like it would for Spotify. And you think, oh, it not so bad, but the problem here was a button where you could listen to all that was removed from your file. And that's when my heart sank. It's like, fuck, Absolutely. this is what's not there now. This yeah. is what they take out of my mix to make it 10 megabytes big rather than, I don't know, 80 or 90 or whatever. 
And then someone said, yeah, the best possible fucking algorithm at the time uh, from MP3, keep 25% of the data. The best one. Yeah. The rest is gone. <laughs> because they use uh, uh, some kind of brain thing like an algorithm that knows what the human mind actually can listen to at at one time you know you cannot focus on on all the stuff so they kind of learn what to filter out and what to remove and you sit you sit there oh, still sounds the same to me yeah we just removed 75 percent of the material of, of the of the code or i don't know what to say it because it, the hi-hat is still there and the kick is still there you know yeah. but it's like gone i say if i have this fucking software you know and push that button i i cannot cannot handle it but but there are ways to to kind of listen to how stuff will sound when it's going through um kind of the streaming engines you know you you learn you learn that in a bit but yeah, that was not not a pleasant thing so this to master something for itunes or for spotify that's just damage control that that's not wow but mastering for vinyl I actually feel that I make a difference. Yeah, yeah. What, what I actually found funny in your answer there was um, you said that you'd done some cleaning, but I bet your wife came in and looked at the studio and she said, uh, did you call that clean? <laughs> but, uh... No, actually, she, uh, she used to hate it down here uh, because she said it smells to old cellar and dust. And now she actually hung out here a bit. She actually played piano a bit and she really liked it. It looks really like, you know, these shows on TV where a team of guys show up yes. to this couple and it's all like a cluttered mess. And they say, okay, here you go to a hotel and we will reinvent your home. And they all come back and it's like, oh, this is so nice. Blah, blah, blah. That's what I did to my own studio, pretty much. I, I think 75% of the stuff is gone. It's up in the attic. Wow. You know, wow. it, it's, it's not shit I use. I mean, I had every, it's all potential dust collectors and all shit I have to clean to keep it clean. So I, I kept a few things that, that is nice. I'm my vinyl player because there are actually times when I have to check a test pressing or whatever, and I don't want to have to connect it every time because connecting a vinyl player is a bit of a drag. Yeah. You know, it's just no, no phones jack or whatever. Yeah. So I have that up and all the vinyl from my own bands and all the vinyl from the shit I mix that I still have is in the, in the, cupboard or what you call it under like the hi-fi set old school you know yeah and um i have my old uh, the stuff that looks good my old 16 track fastex that i did all the early stuff in the 90s and i have this quarter inch reel to reel that this super nice guy from hungary gave me so i could do some old masters from reel to reel again on Bandcamp. i kept that shit that looks cool and that's worth my time dusting it <laughs> <laughs> the rest is just gone you know uh, I, I have to sell a lot of gear. Yeah, a lot of stuff I bought that I never really used properly, and I think it's only gonna only gonna be here and lose value, and that's gonna kill me. You know, yeah. I paid blah 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 for that thing, and now you only get this. Yeah, but you didn't use it for four years, you fucking idiot. So yeah, that's <laughs> that's my future actually. I'm gonna gonna work on the stuff I work on, and I'm gonna make sure that I, I sell or trade it for better mic preamps or whatever which I'm never using other than doing podcasts, which is ironic. I bought like a 2000 euro valve microphone because I thought it would boost my will to sing. You know, I think I used it for two podcasts and that's it. <laughs> it's tragic, you know, but what the fuck, you know, it's just like, no, I'm not that musician guy anymore. Um, I would rather invest it in, in some plugin or some magical software or whatever to make, to make my life easier. Cool. Well, I would also be jealous. You talk about your collection and stuff like that. I would love to see the size of your music collection. It must be absolutely frightening. But I hope, I hope that you keep it all in alphabetical order, though. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I used to. I, there, there was a time when I... Um, th that's also like kind of when my father's weird, whatever he had, Ausberger syndrome, <laughs> whatever he was. Mm -hmm. when, when he did something, he did it correctly or don't do it at all kind of guy. So he, he, he brought that to me that when, when you do alphabetically, it's like alphabetically and it's like super complicated. And I used to have it in that way, yeah. but once you move it and it all turns into a mess and you have like, I don't know, 800 of them and they all ended up being scrambled. Yeah. I just don't have the time. And there was a time 
when I thought, let's at least do my vinyl, my personal vinyl from the bands I did. And uh, no, but I didn't, you know, it, it's probably 50 of them or whatever, but no, I could do this instead, or I could do that instead. You know, time is extremely precious these days. And uh, my CD collection used to be extremely massive when you saw it. Now it's in like eight Ikea boxes because I bought some very special, super thin plastic cover like 15 years ago that yeah. keeps also the, the backside of the CDs there, you know? So you have the entire layout, but there is no plastic box. So you can fit like, I don't know, wow, 30, 40 CDs in a really small space. And when I moved from Sweden to Germany, that, that was, they came in pretty handy. Of course, I remember the, the old school CD and vinyl boxes yeah. moving that would just never end, you know? Yeah. And, um, I do have a lot of cool shit. That, that's for sure. But some of the coolest shit, I was stupid enough to to uh, to not look after properly. Like all the early thrash and death albums, death metal albums, they were at the sleeping quarters of Unisound for the guys to listen to at a time when vinyl was laughable. Like yeah. you couldn't believe it because CD is so much cooler. I put all the cool shit there for them to listen to while they were drunk and some old Sony stereo without a CD player even. And uh, when I moved Unisound to Örebro, I went up there to, to clean out the, the flat. Yeah, and of course they had cleaned out the vinyl closet. It was maybe some strange album that no one cared, you know, but all the cool shit was all gone. And I cannot just say to all the 50 bands that live there, you stole my vinyl collection, you fuckers, you know? It was probably uh, uh, something that happened gradually, but when someone, and, and it was also so, if I would have cared so fucking much about that original pressing of Darkness Descends or whatever, why the fuck did I put it there? Where there would be super anti-social weirdo guys <laughs> staying that liked metal, you know? And maybe they liked vinyl still and say, it's not worth anything to this guy, so let's take it, you know? So, uh, yeah, I actually do still have Darkness Descends when I think about it. It's signed by a couple of members even. But there were some some early like thrash and death stuff that, that would be worth uh, probably 20 times what I bought it for wow. uh, if I still had them, which, which uh, saddens me a bit. But I, I do still have a lot of the uh, Edge of Sanity stuff. And, and, uh, uh, and we also were, we were some young of my old stuff. Me. Yeah, also the CDs. You didn't think there would be any value or... I had to sell off some demos to uh, finance uh, the distance relationship when I was using Ryanair airplanes like a fucking bus. Uh, <laughs> I had to sell some demos. And I remember some of them, we sold like some demos for like 70 euros. And I was like, what the fuck? You know, that's a flight right there, you know? So, uh, yeah, but now, of course, I wish I had them. But yeah, then I couldn't have seen my girlfriend, now wife. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> no. shit happens. <laughs> yes, it was a win-win result. Well, listen, Dan, it's been an absolute pleasure. I don't want to damage that voice of you any more than I already have. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> so I appreciate the time uh, that you've came on here. That's a good two hours that we've spoken. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, it's been an absolute yeah, pleasure talking too. to you. Absolute super, pleasure. Super, super nice. Good to hear some Scottish also. Yes, well, um, hopefully when the world opens up again, there's a couple of guys talking about whacking and stuff like that. So uh -huh. de definitely Germany's on the hit list. So Cool. Uh, I know where Unisound Studios is. I'll find you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you will probably. <laughs> yeah. so I'm not that complicated to find. <laughs> yeah, I'll see you at the bar. <laughs> yeah, we have a lot of cool bars around here in yeah. so, Nordrhein-Westfalen in Germany. Yeah, no we have the, the Rock Hard Festival is kind of not super far away. And also Dong Open Air is just around the corner. So there's some cool stuff. Was that you offering um, a couch for the night? <laughs> yeah, probably. We do have a spare bed and a spare room, even. So, uh, well, I'll bring, I'll bring the Jack Daniels in the beer then. I'll get that. So, oh, that, that sounds or some really good Scottish stuff. I'll bring some, Scottish <laughs> of course, of course, of course. <laughs> Thank you very much, Stan. Absolute pleasure. You're welcome. You. Yeah, bye bye then.